um, that have been given life, and we were headed to death, Father. And so as a result of that, to be a new creation in Christ, then what we want to do is we want to share that with other people. And so, Father, we're going to have inconvenient phone calls. Lord, we're going to have emergencies and crises that happen in the middle of the night and we have to work the next day. They're not going to be planned, but yet each one of them is a divine appointment. So just guide us and direct us, and if it's something that you want to do, Lord, then we want to be obedient and follow your lead. And we just pray in Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. So we're in John 13. This morning's message is called, What is Love? Baby, don't hurt me. Oh, no. Is my son awake? There he is. Okay. I'd like to sing that for his benefit. Embarrassment. He'll get me back later in life. So um, where we've been is last week we looked at Jesus pointing at dirty feet. No, washing dirty feet. And he gave the disciples the perfect example, an object lesson in humility. He didn't come to sit on a golden throne to be on Christian television and to pray for love gifts and that kind of a thing. He went to the lowest position in society that, uh, that a slave would take on, and he washed their feet. And we know that they did not have fine uh, road and street systems back then, so it was disgusting. But what Jesus said is, what I have done, you don't realize, but it's an example for you. And so that's where you and I are today. We're to wash dirty feet. And uh, so that's where we've been. And then where we're going to be here this morning in John chapter 13 is we're going to deal with Judas. And so um, first I want to give you some famous quotes about love. Uh, for those of you that are younger, uh, Charles Schultz is the author that uh, came up with the comic strip Peanuts, Charlie Brown, Snoopy. And Charles Schultz said regarding love, all you need is love, but a little chocolate now and then doesn't hurt. Uh, Lemony Snicket said, love can change a person the way a parent can change a baby, awkwardly and often with a great deal of mess. But my favorite quote happens to be from the Princess Bride. <laughs> Death cannot stop true love. All it can do is delay it for a while. <laughs> Inconceivable. So, you've heard where we've been. This is where we are now in John chapter 13. Where we will we be next week? Um, next week, we're going to look at uh, Jesus' farewell discourse. If you guys are familiar with some of the richest part of Scripture in John chapter 15, I'm the branches and you are the vine. Or I'm the vine, you're the branches. We got a whole tree thing going on. It's a vineyard thing. Uh, John 15, 1 through 17 through tw uh, 17, 26. Obviously, we won't cover that much amount of material, but it's nice to have a goal. Uh, but I want to suggest to you that um, John chapter 13, verse 1 is one of the most powerful, uh, deep verses in all of the Bible. And it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And this verse um, carries more weight, or is more profound, as you continue on through uh, the end of chapter 19 in John. Uh, because after the disciples argue over who's the greatest, the Muhammad Ali argument. Um, after Peter, James, and John sleep, rather than hang out with Jesus in prayer, after Judas betrays his master with a kiss, and after all twelve forsake him and flee at his arrest, then read again, Jesus loved them to the end. And that's powerful. In fact, only God can have that kind of love because Judas is included, okay? So the disciples, um, you know, they let him down. They broke his heart. Uh, Jesus was forsaken by the very people he came to save. I think the strongest proof of his deity was not walking on water, uh, not healing the blind, uh, not healing the leper, but being able to love in the most powerful way. And so only God has that kind of love. And I love the point that God's people fail 
but his love for them never fails. And uh, this is the love with which Jesus loved his disciples during this last week. Remember, we're in the Passion Week, um, is the Latin word for suffering, his final week. And so um, I'm grateful that our failures don't dilute or divert his love for us. And we have a Leonardo da Vinci graphic. Uh, You guys are familiar with The Last Supper? Yay, okay. So um, what's interesting is that um, this masterpiece captures the dramatic moment when Jesus announces in verses 21 and 22 that uh, one of you is going to betray me. Um, When he was 43 years old, the Duke uh, Ludovico of Milan asked da Vinci to paint this painting of the Last Supper. So he worked slowly. He was very meticulous. Uh, He spent three years on the assignment. He groups the disciples together. No, it's not an exact uh, reflection of the biblical seating, but, you know, that's okay. Um, He's got three groups Uh, two groups on either side with Jesus in the middle and uh, Christ's arms there you can see are outstretched Um, and in his right hand he holds a cup Um, I think we can see that we see the cup possibly okay sure we'll call it a cup why not okay and so um, when the masterpiece was done after three years um, a friend um, came to Da Vinci and he said look check it out you know look at what I painted He said, give me your opinion of it. And the guy said, it's wonderful. He said, the cup is so real, I cannot divert my eyes from it. And immediately, uh, Da Vinci took a brush and drew it across the sparkling cup. And he exclaimed, nothing shall detract from the figure of Christ. And that's our goal here this morning. Just in case uh, it ever gets blurred or we think we're just making jokes or having fun or whatever, this is all about Jesus. Make no mistake. And so um, this Last Supper is portraying the reaction given by each apostle. Um, It's interesting, if you look at Judas, for example, for some reason I'm not supposed to do that, um, or walk there. If you look at Judas, a couple things to note. um, He's the only one with uh, elbows on the table. So apparently betraying the Lord and bad etiquette go hand in hand, okay? Okay. And he's spilling all over, um, I believe, a salt shaker. And uh, I'm not going to sing a song about the salt shaker, but I will tell you that the disciples were supposed to be the salt of the earth. And he ends up pouring salt in the wounds of Jesus. So what we're going to look at is in John chapter 13, and it's heavy stuff, but it's important that we take it in. Uh, we're going to look at Jesus' betrayer, Judas. So John 13, 18, Judas, Jesus is going to identify his betrayer. He says, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am, and notice that he is in italics by design. Most surely or verily, verily, or truly, truly, depending upon your translation, I say to you, He who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. And when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit. And he testified and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And then the disciples looked at one another, and they were perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Who is that? John, okay? And uh, Simon Peter therefore motioned to him and to ask who it was of whom he spoke, because I'm sure Peter couldn't contain himself. And then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And then Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him. For some thought, because Jesus had the money box, that Jesus said to him, Buy those things we need for the feast. Uh, Remember, at that time, they would give uh, offerings to the poor. 
Having received the piece of bread, then he went out immediately, and it was night. So the new commandment, verse 31, so when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, and here's the qualifying uh, feature, as I have loved you. That's how we are to love one another. That you also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then our final, final text, uh, Jesus is predicting Peter's denial. Verse 36, Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I now follow you now? Or why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. And Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. All right, so that's a lot. Um, he says, look, I don't speak this uh, concerning all of you. He says, I know whom I've chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. So he knows whom he's chosen. And it's so important because when Jesus chooses a person, he knows them. Everything about us, every person on this planet knows us better than anyone else. And so um, he doesn't choose apart from his divine knowledge. Um, it was important for Jesus to tell the disciples this so that they wouldn't be surprised by the betrayal that was going to happen. And somebody has said that um, there's a traitor inside of all of our hearts. Okay, And Jeremiah lets us know that um, only God knows our heart. And, and we need to have that perspective uh, when we're dealing with other people in their sin. How come? We're just like them. At the moment that any one of us places ourselves above anyone else, then we violated the truth of our sin nature. And so Jesus here is quoting, uh, quoting Psalm 41.9. Now he says, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, he's lifted up his heel against me. And it takes me to Genesis 3.15. And that verse is called the Proto-Evangelicum. It's the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. And it's the, it's the prophecy that as uh, God in human form, and that's always Jesus, is talking to Adam and Eve and Satan in the form of a serpent. And he says that uh, in regards to uh, the offspring, the Messiah, the future Messiah, um, he's going to crush Satan's head, right? When does he do that? At the cross. That's where he crushes Satan's head. But he does say that Satan's going to bruise his heel. So this is interesting. Those is Old Testament Jews and all the disciples, all 12, are Jewish. He's quoted Psalm 41.9. He's referring to a heel. He's trying to get the motors turning, okay? Now, David originally wrote, King David wrote Psalm 41, verse 9, in regards to Ahithophel. And that was a guy who was a counselor, we remember, a good friend of David, and he was a faithful friend for many years, and he saw God's hand on David's life. But he became a traitor, and he went to the camp of Absalom, his son, who was trying to usurp the, th the throne. Now, here's the rub. Ahithophel had reason to, to be hateful or to be angry towards David. Does anybody know who Ahithophel's great grand or granddaughter was? The woman who bathed outside, that's why they called her Bathsheba. But um, psh, that was bad. It'll get worse. Hang in there. Get used to disappointment. Okay, so, um, so David not only has an affair with Bathsheba, but then has his son-in-law murdered, Uriah the Hittite. Okay, so Ahithophel is ticked off. And the Bible does not say that we are not to be angry. Jesus himself was angry, right? 
but in control. When he cleansed the temple twice, the beginning of his ministry, the end of his ministry, he went and dealt with the people that were ripping off God's people. Always in control, but definitely angry. And you and I get angry, and that's okay. We just have to be careful what we do with the anger, okay? I always think of my mom giving that person the thumb in traffic. It just cracks me up. Um, <laughs> if only she knew. So here Jesus takes Psalm 41.9. He applies it to Judas. And he's saying that uh, when he says that he's lifted up his heel against me, he's enlarged his heel against me. And Jesus knew that the scripture would be fulfilled. And look how it affects him, verse 19. Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am, and especially in King James, he is in italics. So when Jesus says, I am, well, that'll get their Jewish attention, right? They're saying, Mazel Tov, Oy vey. You're claiming the covenant name of God. Remember Moses and the burning bush? Who do I tell my people you are? God says, tell them I am that I am. And, uh, he probably uh, was looking forward to sharing that with the people. What's God's name? Uh, I am that I am, a.k.a. Uh, Popeye. Okay, so this verse shows the purpose of Jesus' miracle, and he always has a purpose. He's not there just to put on a show, okay? Um, in fact, John 20, 31 says, These things are written that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, and that believing you may have what in his name? Life, eternal life, yeah. Okay, so just like he does for us, he's doing it for the disciples, and especially in the Gospel of John, and it's my favorite gospel for this reason. You can get a young kid, okay, under the age of 10, they can get John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life, and that kid can believe that verse and become a Christian on belief. They can really believe that. You got that level, but John is a book for life. And John is the kind of book where you want to meditate. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house there are many mansions that where I go, you may be also. And that where I go, you may know. And it, it has a depth. So it's an incredible book. But what John is doing here is he's developing their trust. He's developing their faith. He's developing their belief, which is the key word in John. And so he says in verse 20, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So here's the chain. If you receive one that the Lord has sent, then you're receiving the Lord. And if you're receiving him, you're getting the Father. That's the way to the Father's through the Son. So the gospel is both welcoming a person and the accepting of biblical truths about that person, as well as living a life where we're emulating the person of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is reminding his disciples, and Judas is included. Why do you include Judas? Why don't you just figure, hey, he's going to do what he does. He's Judas. Hey, Jude, don't be afraid. Because he still has a chance to make it right. He has that possibility. He can sin at 1 John 1, 9, realize that he blew it, and are you going to tell me that the character and the nature of Jesus Christ is going to say, no, there's no forgiveness for you? Not a chance, okay? So even if Judas, and he does, refuses Christ's love, it doesn't stop us. It doesn't stop you and I from sharing that message, okay? So Judas isn't going to win, and Jesus knows that, and he wants them to know that, that God is in control. And he wants Judas to know that rejecting him means rejecting the God who sent Jesus. That's why he made that statement. And so verse 21, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Jesus was not Mr. Spock. He felt, he wept. He had righteous anger. He loved. He lived the perfect life as man and as God. And what an example of humility. And here he's troubled because of Judas' betrayal. And it's because of Jesus' heart, because Jesus is a redeemer. Jesus is a reconciler. 
Jesus, in this situation, knows that Judas needs him as the answer. Sometimes as men, when we're talking to women, we think we always know the answer, and sometimes we may, but oftentimes you and I need to listen, listen, okay? So here, the restorer um, could have forgiven him, and so Psalm 41.9, my own familiar friend, Judas spent three and a half years eating whatever the guys in Galilee ate. Fish, probably a lot of fish, probably a lot of bread, you know, Jewish bread back then. Um, he saw Jesus laugh. He saw Jesus, if he got bugs in his beard, whoop, 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 okay? He saw him in every occasion and yet was still able to deny him. And that lets us know, and, and Christians will struggle with this, when a leader falls, especially one in the public eye, there are a lot of times there's collateral damage and it should not be because we are not putting our faith in that minister, in that public leader. Our faith is in Christ, who is infallible, who never lets us down. We may not like what he does in our life, and that's okay. Isaiah 44, 8 tells us that our ways and God's ways, well, they're a little far apart as far as the earth atmosphere is to space, okay? So, yeah, a little rabbit trail there, okay? But verse 22, then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. With our New Testament eyes in 2019, we read this, and it's easy to think of Judas as having like the uh, kind of spindly mustache, the curls, you know, and he kind of wore like a black hat. And the rest of the disciples all wore white and were holy, and Judas kind of looked like the bad guy, but not at all, okay? Um, the disciples did not know that Judas was, was the man who was doing what he was doing. So it wasn't obvious to them. Uh, there's nothing suspicious about him. So in this context, they're thinking that Jesus' comment is in reference to some kind of unintended betrayal. Because we read in Matthew 26, 22, that all the disciples will go to Jesus and say, is it me? Am I the one who's done this? Verse 23. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And of course, that's John in an abstract way, but it was John. And I love Simon Peter because the dude just cannot hold his emotion. He's like, Simon Peter therefore motioned to Jesus. You know, who is it that you're speaking about? And then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Now, we will share this every Christmas typically, but as these guys are seated, and it's not represented very well in da Vinci's uh, painting, but they're on a triclinium, which is a Roman kind of U-shaped table, and it's probably maybe three feet off the ground, and uh, I won't make any mother-in-law jokes. And so, uh, probably about three feet high, but and so... Um, this is also a special or ceremonial meal. So they would lay on their stomachs uh, around this table, uh, leaning on their left elbow, eating with the right hand. And so it seems like from that position that John can lean back and he can ask Jesus this question and it's not obvious to everybody else. And so verse 26, Jesus answered, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Okay, during Passover, and this is the Last Supper, the father of the household would offer to the guests pieces of bread, and it was dipped in a sauce, uh, like a fruit sauce, and it represented the fruits of the promised land. And it was the sign of special attention, and it was one more appeal to the conscience of Judas. And so Jesus washed the very heels that were raised against him in Judas. And he fed a morsel to the very lips that would kiss his cheek to identify his betrayers. And you and I, everybody in this room has been backstabbed. We've been double-crossed. We've been betrayed by somebody who should not have done that to us. Amen? Okay, so no treachery is worse than somebody who's within a family or a close friend. Uh, Julius Caesar knew such treachery. Among the conspirators who assassinated the Roman leader on the Ides of March 44 BC was Marcus Junius Brutus. 
I wonder how old he was before he could actually say his own name. Hi, I'm Marcus, okay. So um, Caesar not only trusted Brutus, he had favored him as a son, and according to Roman historians, Caesar first resisted the onslaught of the assassins. But when he saw Brutus um, among them and he had his dagger drawn, Caesar ceased to struggle, and pulling top part of his robe over his face, he asked the famous question, et tu Brute, which means in Latin, you too, Brutus? And so this was kind of like the epitome of betrayal. And here's what Satan thought. If I could get your attention here this morning, if you hear anything this morning, please hear this. Satan thought that he could get Jesus bitter. He thought he could get him bitter at one of the 12. And a lot of times we might think, for example, that Satan wanted to get Jesus onto the cross. I disagree. I think Satan is a stellar theologian. For example, in the book of Jude, it says that Michael, the archangel, contended with Satan over the body of Mo, right? Why would he do that? Would they have like a used body sale or something like that? Why would he? Because he's a theologian. He understands theology. He may have understood the two witnesses in Revelation. He may have understood the triumph or the Mount of Transfiguration. I don't know. But I think that Satan wanted to keep Jesus from the cross, and that could not happen. Okay? Verse 27. Now, after the piece of bread, Satan entered him, and then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. And Jesus knew at this point that Judas has passed any ability or any um, decision to do the right thing. So he, set him, he sets him on his course, uh, do what you do, do it quickly. And so Jesus is going to have to deal with what G Judas did. And the sooner this delusion reached its end, the better. But it's in Matthew 26, 25, where uh, Jesus again makes this declaration and he points out to Jesus because Judas comes to Jesus privately, Matthew 26, 25, and he says, is it I? And Jesus says, you have said it. And the point is, Judas knew that Jesus knew that he would betray him. So there's never a doubt in Judas' mind. Here's the question of the year. How do we respond when a heel of betrayal comes crushing down on us? You know, I have to teach this, okay? So that means I have to live it, and I'm looking at it, and immediately in my mind, I'm thinking about, you know, there have been times where I have been bitter, and I've replayed scenarios, and some of you know, because I've whined to you over the years, but the truth of the matter is, is that you cannot read this book on a daily basis and get convicted without getting convicted and confronted with your heart's truth, okay? It has to line up with God's truth or we get up here and then we're just faking it, you know, and it's just entertaining time and that's not what we're called to do. So I'm scratching my head. I'm thinking, okay, uh, there are times where I haven't and, and God met me this week, which was really awesome. But I'm asking myself, I'm saying, so how does Jesus do that? How do you love a guy who's basically selling you out to get killed, who's being fake? Because, you know, sometimes we can get past a betrayal if that person moves to Saskatchewan. You know, if they're in Amity, love you guys, Glenn, bless. If they're in another other place, then you talk with people, you work it out, you get scripture, or you can do that. But what is harder about betrayal is when they don't leave. <laughs> They're still in your life. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And you have to be able to, in a godly manner, deal with it. And if anybody has written the definitive book on how to do this perfectly, you're going to be wealthy. But because we know that's not true, this is what God took me to. And it's important that you and I look for Jesus in the New Testament and the Old Testament. Because this took me to Isaiah 50. And I want to read to you out of Isaiah 50, because this opened my eyes, just blew my mind. Isaiah 50, let's begin about verse 5. In regards to the Messiah, 
Okay, and, and we're going to look at Jesus and his perspective about going to the cross. It says in verse 5, The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn away. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. And we're going to get into what he does here, his, his attitude, his anthem of heart. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, unstoppable, unshakable. And I know that I will not be ashamed. He is near who justifies me. Who will condemn with me or who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near me. I want to suggest to you that in this situation, truth be told, Jesus died to himself a long time ago before he gave up the ghost on the cross. He died to himself and his own uh, agenda in terms of what made him feel good. But don't miss this crucial point. Jesus Christ was unstoppable with the calling that the Father put on his life. You could not stop him. And so, I'm thinking, okay, teenagers. What are some of the adjectives that we think of when we describe teenagers? They have energy. They're rebellious. Who here, for example, was not rebellious as a teen? Let's see your hand. Travis Dodge, nice. (laughs) Nice. Right on. We've got one. Amber wasn't rebellious. We've got two. Is anybody else going to tell the truth? Okay. For the most part, we rebel as teens, right? Because we're not really a kid, but we're not really quite an adult. Unless you're like Mary or something like that, you know, in the New Testament with Jesus or something. Okay. So, think about this. Do you think it was God's plan and his intention to have teenagers... Uh, rebel against their parents, maybe not listen to their parents as much, and to do things differently than what their parents has for them, do you think that's God's perfect plan, his perfect will? No, okay? So, do you think maybe then God put that within a teenager for a specific purpose? Because I'll tell you what, one of the things I see in teens is that when they're into something or they want to do something, they are all in. They are enthusiastic about it. Spirit fingers? They are in it. In fact, they will be consumed by it. They will be steadfast. They will have joy. They will have emotion. Okay, they're very passionate people. I want to suggest to you that the reason that they have that, that we have that as teens, is so that we use that to not be tempted by what the world offers to be that way towards God unshakable, unstoppable. Now, people might say, and I love this, the pessimist says, well, what can one person do? And I want to respond to that person, that pessimistic thought, and say, I'll tell you what one person can do. Who here knows who Flory Evans is? F-L-O-R-R-I-E. She was not famous, but what she did is very famous in heaven, okay? She is the teenage girl, teenage girl that nobody's heard of, who inspired Evan Roberts, that people that know revival history know about the Welsh revival, 1904, 1905. Flory Evans is generally regarded as having sparked off the Welsh revival. Edwin J. Orr, that's O-R-R, not Edwin or somebody else, Edwin Orr once observed that all six of the populated continents of the world experienced a noticeable and spontaneous spiritual awakening around 1905, all being impacted by a greater or lesser extent by the Welsh revival, which had begun the previous year. One teenage girl, all she did was love Jesus. All she did was sell out for Jesus it impacted all continents in the known world. So that's my answer to anybody that says, what can one person do? What can one teenager do? A lot. Verse 28. But no one at the table knew for what reason he said this to him, to Judas. For some thought, because Judas had the money box, 
that Jesus has said to him, we'll buy those things we need for the feast, uh, or that he should give something to the poor. Now, if Peter had known what Judas was going to do, really, what would Peter have done? I think he would have knocked off both ears. Yeah, Judas would not have been hearing at that moment. That's right, okay. He just needed a better aim, okay? Um, this is the heavy part that blows me away. Because, okay, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm in this scenario, I'm thinking, you know, Judas, you need to take out the trash. <laughs> Judas, you, you know, did you cut the lawn, Judas? You know, I've got some jobs for Judas to do. Jesus never let on what he knew about Judas to the other disciples. That is love. Okay, a lot of times we come into contact with people and where's the hardest place to, to live like a Christian? Home. Second place, workplace. Okay, or if you go on a vacation, you know, like Daniel. You know, <laughs> he's in Babylon and well, nobody there knows him, so I don't know what he could have done, but I don't want to think about that. Okay, so... Um, Jesus treated Judas just like the others. Now, when we talk to people at work, you talk to people in your family, people that aren't saved, and they might wonder, like John's got his Bible open right now, eh, why do you read that thing? Why do, you, why do you worship? You know, why do people become uh, missionaries? Right? Why, do, why do Christians do this? The answer is because we are trying to learn how to love like Jesus did, and we can't do it without those things. That's why we pray. That's why we're getting changed from the inside out. We sing that worship song. So, Warren Wiersbe said, Jesus with the towel is the perfect example of humility, and Judas with the bread is a perfect example of hypocrisy and treachery. So having received the piece of bread, verse 30 he then went out immediately, and it was night. So he still got the taste of bread in his mouth that Jesus gave him, the opportunity for him to repent and to get right. He's got that flavor in his mouth as he flees at night. And Jesus, Judas, it's hard to say Jesus and Judas, Judas um, left his fellow disciples, and this is something, this is another reason why we do things when we call, I think non-Christians think that our words are just weird. What did you guys do over the weekend? Well, we had fellowship and propitiation and there was sanctification going on. It was phenomenal. They're like, what? We hang out with other Christians because on our own, we come up with bad ideas. Judas, bad idea, okay? So perhaps the events earlier at the dinner, you've got Jesus, the foot-washing Messiah. Maybe Judas thought, you know, he's not the guy. I, well, you could spend hours or days or a long amount of time trying to figure out why Judas did that. That's okay. A better question is, why do I sin? It's a better question. Okay? Because I'm Judas. You are Judas. We are Judas collectively. All right? So um, that drives us to God. It's not like, well, I think it might be a Oh, a nice idea, I occasionally get into God's word, or, or maybe try to, you know, leap year, share something with a, a relative about Christ. No, we, we are driven as Christians to do what God has called us to do. In fact, there are times where the words fail because you are aching for God in your life. And that's where we want to read this perspective. So verse 31, when he said, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. There's a lot of glorification going on there. And the cross was Jesus' moment of glory. Um, it's at the cross of Jesus where we see man at his worst and God at his best. And so Jesus made five references to glory in the space of two verses. And it's with good reason, because the world would look at the cross and say, oh, it's humiliating, it's disgusting, it's disgraceful, it's disgraceful. And Jesus looked at the cross, knowing what would be accomplished, he looked at it and saw you and I. And so verse 33, little children, I shall be with you a little while longer, and you will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. 
So now I say to you, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Now, if you're an Old Testament scholar, you might say, well, wait a minute. Deuteronomy says that we are to love one another, and you would be correct. But Jesus qualified this verse. He says, love one another as I have loved you. Oh, that's the stinger. The word commandment in Latin is the word we get uh, mandatum or mandate. And this is why Thursday of Passion Week, Passion Week is called Maundy or Maudy Thursday. It comes from the mandate. And it was the day that Jesus gave a new mandate to his disciples to love one another as Jesus loves. And that's the heart of this whole passage. Love three times, times three. And the mark of the Christian is not a leather Bible. And the mark of the Christian is not the aluminum fish on the back of our car. And it's not the t-shirts. You know, the mark of a Christian is love. And if somebody, if you look at your favorite teacher or whatever, sometime, just turn off the volume. Because a man that loves to preach the word of God smiles. Because it's a calling most of us are not doing this to get rich. Otherwise, we've blown it, okay? You do this because you have to do this. And we're going to celebrate John uh, sure on the 20th of this month because God has called him, and we are just recognize what God is already doing to have John ordained. But we don't really do the ordaining. It, it comes from Christ. Spurgeon said it's the um, empty-headed laying hands on the empty-headed we love Spurgeon. He had some quotes, though. I feel sorry for Mrs. Spurgeon. She was probably like, take out the trash. All right. All right, so we're going to wrap it up by verse, verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for another. And, and that's, that's the mark. It's not our theology, and it's a struggle. You see people a lot of times having the call for ministry, and we want to prove ourselves. We want to know. We're afraid if somebody at a Bible study or in a setting, they ask a, us a question, and we might not know the answer. And join the club, okay? If you don't know the answer, one, you're being honest, which is a great trait in somebody who's teaching, and two, when you go and look up the answer, you will know that answer. It will make an impact on you. Daniel Fusco does that. I love that. Do we love the way Jesus loves? Michael Card writes, the only distinguishing mark of Christians in the first century church was noted by pagans. And what they were able to figure out is they looked at them and they said, see how they love one another. When the pagans, the unbelievers, the atheists, the agnostics are the ones that are touting your love, something good is happening. Something God-oriented is happening, okay? So Jesus is going to predict Peter's denial. Uh, oh, how little we know ourselves. Verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I not follow you now? I will... Lay down my life for your sake. And Peter is relying on his strong resolve. He's relying on his willpower. He was very emotional. If you want to look at the difference, the impact that happens on Peter, look at before and after the cross. He's not perfect after the resurrection. You know, he's still going to have to be corrected, but he's, he's guided differently. It's not by the, uh, Lord, I'll never deny you. You know, and sure, these other schmucks will, but I never will. Um, it was more like, hey, we're here on the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, and this is that which was prophesied from the prophet Joel, and then gives a sermon that the Holy Spirit so blessed that the church began as a result. But, you know, a lot of times we can rely on our confidence, and God will deal with our confidence. Amen? He does deal with our self-confidence. We want to be Godfident. Sam's got that hoodie. Godfident. So Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. And we believe Peter. We believe him with his passion at this point would have uh, died for Jesus right then. But again, uh, emotion's only going to carry you, you for so long. Now, 
what the Bible does is the Bible will put people, he will align people for comparison and contrast. If you're in the book of Judges sometime, look at Samson and then look at Jephthah. They're, very, they're a study in opposites. We want to look here at Judas and Peter, okay? Uh, for example, we might say that Judas' denial of Jesus was deliberate and planned. Peter's denial of Jesus was accidental and spontaneous. Peter's denial, or Peter's denial was terrible, but it wasn't the same as what Judas did. We see a different Peter again when his walk is no longer built on emotion, but on the work of Jesus on the cross. And where we want to end off here, and then we're going to, um, as a family, we're going to take communion. Uh, it's a great way to start off the new year to remember what Jesus has done for us in 1 Corinthians 11. But please remember this a point before we get into communion, that Christ must first die for Peter before Peter can die for Jesus. That's true for you and I. You know, there is, I got blessed, Josh Mullins hooked me up with an A.W. Tozer uh, devotional. And that's my before to go to bed devotional when I'm not listening to the police scanner. <laughs> because I want to have that God breath you know, as I'm going to sleep, and then I want to wake up, and I want to, I want to grab the, the leather Bible. So it's at this time where, as a church family, we want to remember uh, Jesus' sinless sacrifice. So uh, we're going to have a worship song. The ushers are going to bring forth the elements, and then we'll just have a few words before we, uh, we get into this.